Good evening. Welcome to the INSS. Uh, we are very pleased to host in the uh, two days uh, our friends from the Belfast Center, from the Kennedy School of Government, from the Harvard University, a distinguished uh, delegation led by uh, Secretary Ash Carter and Ambassador Nick Burns. Uh, it's a very fruitful dialogue, open, sometimes uh, even go to high tones, but professional, uh, on the spot, on some most important issues that the United States and Israel are facing, some from a position of a superpower, others from a position of a small state, but we have a lot together. We decided to uh, have an open uh, session to the public because we want you also to enjoy from the wisdom uh, of uh, our guests and to get a sense of what we are talking about. And tonight we have two very, very distinguished leaders uh, that led the two security, uh, the two security establishment in uh, the United, United States, States uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, retired three years ago and went back to the right place to uh, a thinking uh, organization on strategy and policy recommendations. Then again, it's a thinking organization. <laughs> okay, I got it. And we have on my uh, other side, we used to be in the general staff, uh, shoulder to shoulder for five years. Uh, I as head of intelligence and Gadi in the beginning as head of uh, operation and then the Northern Command uh, commander and we share a lot of time together. Uh, he retired only a year ago, uh, decided to go to Washington uh, to change the perspective of life and how things are looking from uh, the capital of the uh, main superpower and now we came back and choose also to join a distinguished think tank which is the INSS so uh, we are uh, congratulate him for joining us it's a huge uh, contribution to the to the center to the Institute and tonight I will interview uh, both of them uh, because Gadi wanted to be very precise and the six months in uh, Washington haven't made him and with Ox Oxfordian uh, English, uh, my question to Gadi and his answer will be in Hebrew. Uh, there is translation and uh, I hope that uh, the translation will be accurate the way you, you will uh, uh, answer your questions. So I will start uh, with somebody who was not yet the Minister of Defense, uh, and then I go to the uh, more senior uh, figure. And let me start with uh, Gadi. On the six months you have been in uh, Washington, in the Washington Institute, uh, you uh, decided to uh, research Tfisat Habitachon Shel Israel. מדיניות הביטחון של ישראל. האם תוכל להסביר לקהל הנכבד הזה מדוע הנושא... in the government and in the Ministry of Defense and in the IDF for each part of that doctrine and concept. Good evening. The State of Israel was incepted at a time of war and since 48 the reality that we experience is an ongoing time of war, campaigns, ongoing security and dealing with security issues throughout the existence of the State of Israel. This issue of paramount importance which must ensure 
its existence and its protection happens miraculously without a national security concept. It has been happening as such, at least without a formal one since its inception, except in the 18th point of Ben-Gurion, documented in 53, and submitted to the government Ben Gurion at the time in 53. Twenty years ago, I was a member of the Prime Minister, a military secretary, and I saw how important it is to have that kind of trust in the security forces with anyone who thought that education and infrastructure really ties and interacts with everyone who should be involved. התמניתי לרמטכ"ל לפני חמש שנים, ואחת ההחלטות הראשונות הייתה לכתוב את אסטרטגיית צה"ל, ואסטרטגיית צה"ל נכתבה בשתי ורסיות, אחת גלויה והשנייה חשאית. הגלויה נועדה גם לציבור, שיכיר את האופן שבו צה"ל מממש את הייעוד שלו. המחשבה שלנו פה, וכתבתי את זה ביחד עם פרופ' גבי סיבוני, שהוא חבר במכון בשישה חודשים האחרונים, הייתה לכתוב תפיסת ביטחון כאילו אנחנו נמצאים בנעלי המנהיג. נכתבו ספרים מרשימים, נכתבו מאמרים יוצאים מן הכלל גם פה ב-NSS. המחשבה הייתה לכתוב קווים מנחים לתפיסת ביטחון, וככה זה נכתב. אני חושב שבמדינה כמו שלנו יש איזה צורך חיוני, צורך לפקוד פריבילגיה. I think if we're talking about our law, which is for national security, has made it incumbent upon the INSS to update this the whole time, update the Ministry of Defense to update it. But unfortunately, it hasn't been done. And I think that the time has come that it should be done for the public and a confidential, classified one, so that this will be a vision and inspiration and a compass for all those who are involved in the reinforcement of our national security. Now I'd like to move over to a security issue that is so critical, perhaps not the most important, but that is the issue of the Iranian nuclear issue. We're not going to start talking about the JCPOA, whether it was an excellent one or not, or the best ever of non-proliferation, or was it a terrible one, because there are differences of opinions, and we're also not going to deliberate whether Trump should have left or not. But what I'd like to hear is your position and your opinion about where we are going from now, 18 months after he rescinded and he left the agreement, Trump. How are we going to work with Iran after all they have started violating their side of the agreement? And also vis-a-vis -vis where Iran is very active in the conventional weaponry issue, not the nuclear one, assuming that when there is maximum pressure wielded against him, he will compromise, but we've seen we've seen aggression on his part, a willingness to take risks. Perhaps when the when there are negotiations with the President Trump, we will see what happens. When the agreement was signed in 2015 in the army, we said that it was a strategic turning point. We saw embedded in that great risks, we saw holes as well, but we saw an opportunity. The opportunity was as at that window of time that we believed would continue till 2030, 2032, wherein there would be a risk at the end, wherein it would turn into a kind of um, nuclear threshold country. And we knew that we, they would be able to supply um, capabilities to really do so. And the public eye and political eye really was focused on this nu nuclear threat. But there's an additional threat that's been going on for a long time, and that is their desire to reach a regional hegemony. They've already done it in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq. Um, Yemen and the Gaza Strip and even in Bahrain and in other places and through that 
activate and use um, energy exerted against the State of Israel. In 2018, with our maximum policy pressure on them, stopped a reality that had been created that had been nascent during those years of accumulating budget and weapons so that would actually deepen and entrench their military involvement. We saw it in Syria, we saw over $10 billion that were invested, we saw it in the Gaza Strip, $100 million per annum. And so when we understood that with the nuclear plan there is no change in their vision, but there is a change in the scope of their investments and therefore this maximum pressure policy brought about achievements that we can see the actual uh, proof of. We can see that in Iran, Iraq and even in Lebanon and this causes difficulties to the Iranians. But if you are talking about the Iranian maximum pressure over the last six months, there's a kind of contra pressure against them. And we can see that in the sort of scraping away, gnawing away at the, at the JCPOA. Saudi, we've seen when we saw those um, containers actually in the Gulf, and we've seen in the Golan Heights what's happening, very different from what we'd experienced in the past. There was a lot of talk about the way army actually perceives the Iranian threat. One thing, there was not an argument about it, is their desire to reach their nuclear capability. So on one hand, there's a risk, and we've seen that on our northern border. We've seen the return to the enrichment in some of the components that they've started sort of scraping away at that agreement and the willingness for an ongoing friction, not only with the Saudis, but with us on our northern arena, on our northern theater after many years of activities. Uh, the Iranian self-confidence that was built after their significant significance in Saudi Arabia, there their campaign really did surprise the Americans even and ourselves with their quality of their ca military capability. Do you think that this could be reiterated against Israel? And if it could happen, then what would this lead to? There's something perhaps misleading about the Iranians. If you look at their history, for many a year, they never declared war against their foes. As uh, to the best of my knowledge, if even if you go back centuries, they never opened in an overt war against their foes, but rather reacted to attacks against them. But on the other hand, there was negative, active, uh, subversive activities going on by the Quds forces that was established for the sake of that and have been working globally around the world. We saw the first signs of that over the last uh, sort of 18 months. The Iranians were sent over a UAV and we intercepted it before it, interve it actually intercepted and actually penetrated the state of Israel and then we attacked more extensively. Following that, there was an attempt in May 2018 to try and send over 60 rockets over to the state of Israel, to the depths of the state of Israel. So yes, these um, their capabilities can actually be activated. They've got a very high capabilities. Their weaponry and ammunition are very sort of high capabilities. And so they can really, really worry us with this capability and what happened in Saudi Arabia should worry us immensely and our neighbors for as far as we're concerned Iran for over 10 years is the, the number one mission for the IDF and our security forces and I also think that in Syria we've seen an intel supremacy which actually makes it difficult for them to act freely I would like to now move over to the right hand side so breathe a little bit and I I'm going to move over to Secretary Ash Carter. Thank you very much for your friendship. Thank you for everything you've done for the United States security and for the Israeli security and for the cooperation between the two countries. 
Uh, when you look at uh, threats to the American national security, how it was changed in the last two, three, five years uh, after two decades of having terror as the main threat, we are now seeing, I think, different threats. We are, we are, and you're exactly right. First of all, let me thank you, Amos, for having me and my delegation here with Ambassador Burns, a uh, distinguished colleague from the State Department and uh, a member of the Belfer Center, um, where I now am also. And this is a very important dialogue for us uh, and for my country to have so that thinkers in our country and thinkers in your country have a time to get together. I'm delighted that my friend General Eisenkot is joining you. You're very lucky. Uh, I'm lucky to have good colleagues as well. You have excellent colleagues and I'm grateful. And I thank you all for uh, attending. Uh, as well, because it shows both uh, interest in the issues, which is commendable, and the interest in of hear, hearing what other people have to say, visitors, in my case, uh, and I commend you for that uh, also. So yeah, the situation has changed greatly. And let me uh, take you back. I think the story begins when the, for me, uh, a guy who had his first job at the peak of the Cold War in the Department of Defense of Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Defense to Ronald Reagan. So I wrote, that's how I got into this whole business, is through the Cold War. Then the Cold War ended. And for about the first 10 years, Amos, I would say most of us in the United States were fairly relaxed uh, about major strategic threats. China was uh, too weak to worry about Russia was in decline and at any rate wanted to be a member of the Western community, wanted to be. This is now Yeltsin's Russia. Uh, and reasonable people, who included me for much of that decade, I thought, um, could believe that they would turn out differently than they have turned out. By around 2000, it was clear to me that they were not turning out that way. That Putin's Russia was going to be Putin's Russia. And he's very eloquent about what that means. That China, as we went from Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao to, to Xi Jinping, became more and more the China that we always knew might develop, but hoped wouldn't. That is, a China intent upon redressing the hundred years of humiliation and not just having a place in the world, but a domineering place in the world. So neither of those countries turned out the way that we would have hoped. And by 2000 or so, we may have begun to deal with that problem. But then four airliners crashed into the United States. And there began an era of Iraq, Afghanistan, most recently for me, a war in Syria and Iraq, which uh, I had everything to do with starting and I'm, or responding to, and I'm very glad of it, the war to destroy ISIS, uh, which was necessary and successful. And uh, even for somebody like me, who had concluded around 2000 that Russia and China were not turning out very well, when your country is at war and you are in the Department of Defense, I was the number three, the number two, and then the number one. And during all that time, our people in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria were fighting. Is that distracting? It absolutely is distracting. You can't have it either way. You wake up every morning think about the, thinking about them, and you go to bed every night thinking about them. And so we were distracted. I was all in for our people in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria. And so it took energy. It took some resources, and we're still only now steering our strategy, I think, and the tools of our strategy fully towards a world that is tr in, in recognition of the very different dangers that China and Russia uh, face. It's worth reminding ourselves, by the way, what they are. I don't want to go on for, for, for a long time. They are very different. They're major kinds of uh, uh, dangers for us. Um, uh, we also have China, North Korea, and 
terrorism, so they're not the only thing. We have to spread ourselves out, as you do, over a number of threats. Um, and I'm not somebody who believes that war is inevitable or even likely with either one of them. But you don't get what you want in geostrategic life. You have to work for it. And so we now are constructing strategies in the United States um, to um, defend our interests against both of China and Russia, as they have turned out to be, um, and if possible, prevent war. And certainly if there is war, win war. You know, the great power competition uh, with mostly China, but also Russia, but people in Israel are find it difficult to understand what is the threat that China is posing to the United States? Are they going to, to California with their troops? Are they going to uh, have a dominant uh, position through economy, through cyber? What is the threat? Why it's the Chinese question. want uh, to compete with you? Uh, it seems like you are doing very well in doing business together. And that's what you'd think. And of course, that was what we hoped the Chinese would continue to think. That was what I think to some extent Jiang Zemin at least said he thought, that the Asian miracle was indeed a miracle. Uh, and it was the environment of peace and security in the Asia Pacific that, uh, that, that created the environment in which first Japan, then South Korea, then Taiwan, then Southeast Asia, and today China and India rise, emerge, and improve their people. The United States has never been opposed to any of that. Um, however, uh, Asia is very important to us. It is half the world's economy and half the world's population. And we want to keep that environment of peace and stability and openness going. China has taken a different view um, uh, of it. And I don't contest, and I don't think most Americans contest China's being a communist dictatorship. That's what it is, and that is not the society I want us to be, and I don't believe it's the society that Israel wants to be. Um, but unlike our long competition with the Soviet Union, it is not an objective of the United States to strangle China. Uh, at the same time, we have to protect our own economic interests in uh, that region, and that means recognizing that the China, the playing field is not even. They can bring the tools of a communist dictatorship to bear upon our trading, other trading partners, companies in those trading partners, and companies in our own country. Tools that our societies like ours can't bring to bear because we are not statist countries. That's an uneven playing field. And so the principal place where we compete is on an economic battlefield, which is not a real battlefield at all. Uh, and I, so I think most of what the United States is trying to do is put together a politically and economic policy to deal with a China that is a communist dictatorship. Now, at the same time, they're doing things to bully militarily our friends and allies. And since that's an important part of the world and we have important friends and allies there, we need to push back on those things. I believe the Chinese respond to push back. And I think in areas like the South China Sea, I wish we had started earlier, um, but I think we have to push back against, because remember the Chinese, it starts with uh, Tibet and then there's and ta Taiwan, then Hong Kong, the nine dash line, there's a, it's a little bit like the Iranians over here in the Gulf. It's one thing after another is a core interest of China. And my answer to the Chinese is, you know, it's not a core interest for Ash Carter if you announce it as a core interest. Um, and it's the nine dash line, for example, in the, in the Pacific is just a mark with a crayon on a map. Um, and we need to, I respect China's history. I want it to have, I want its people to be prosperous and to have its rightful place in the world. But it is first and foremost about being Chinese. 
and succeeding for China, and that's not the same as succeeding for the United States and succeeding for everybody else in its region. So uh, it's a very good question you ask, and the answer is it's not that I think they're going to attack us tomorrow, which is what your your question. It could come to that, and if you leave things fester long enough, it will come to that. So we need to tame this relationship militarily and above all economically so that we can live with it uh, for a long time because that's our aspiration and they aren't going to be what we hope they'd be. And so it's going to have to be a different policy. So let's hope that it will not deteriorate into a military conflict. But I want to take advantage of your deep knowledge in technology and science uh, combined with policy crafting. Uh, when you envision uh, a military struggle in 2035, 15 years from now, uh, how you build the force for 2035? What are the elements? Is it still airplanes, submarines, cyber, space? What is the future of warfare? Um, so let's, ta let's, let's start out with what's going to happen to all the things that are, we're, are, we're familiar with. Um, I, I fought hard for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter program, and one of the last things I did as Secretary of Defense was deliver the two, first two of them to Israel. And they're very good we aircraft. Thank you very much they're for that. They're very good aircraft. Yeah, well, it's a sign of uh, a good friend, and America is a good friend to Israel, and I certainly believe that. Um, but it's also a good airplane, and by the way, we're buying it for ourselves. I will tell you that I think that's probably the last manned air, uh, tactical aircraft we'll ever build. I started the B-21, the new stealth bomber program also for the United States. That is probably the last manned bomber. For those who build. joined the Air Force, uh, it is serving 40 years. So you will have the whole career so you will flying manned airplanes. Maybe not the entire career, but but at any rate, you need to get ready, nevertheless, because things are going to change. F already, a manned aircraft is not really an air, a, a tactical aircraft so much as it is a node in a network, and that's how we think about the B. I, tell, I for example, think about the B twenty one bomber. Uh, it may actually not drop the bombs; it may serve as the network from which other kinds of munitions are, are dispatched. Um, so there will be a cyber dimension, there will be a space dimension, there will be other forms of asymmetrical warfare as a dimension to, and slowly the, you'll see the human go out. I think in 30 years or so we'll have what is called AGI for the artificial intelligence people. Uh, artificial general intelligence, that is enough intelligence truly to replace the pilot in the aircraft. We may still be fly, flying air vehicles of some kind. Um, let's take the infantry next, if we, because we have army people here. Um, uh, I think there will still be infantrymen, um, but probably the first soldier through the door of the how the the uh, uh, building being cleared will not be a human. It'll be a robot. And the reason for that is that nobody, and I would never put one of my people in that position if I could avoid it. Uh, now, I still want a human, you know, officer commanding, other people in support, but even as we have robots that go up to bombs now, and disable them, and we do that routinely, we will have people in an infantry squad, we'll have a mixture, and slowly there will be a transition. And I could go on and on, same thing for ships, space, and so forth. A great transition is going to occur, it's going to occur faster probably than the military professions find comfortable, because that's true almost everywhere in life, where technological change is going faster than jobs can adjust. It will be true in the military, but it is inexorable. And I was determined as Secretary of Defense that we be the first to have each of those 
capabilities and that we share that share them with our our friends our long-standing friends and friends and values like like um, like Israel but it's not a birthright to be the technological leader uh, we're gonna have to work hard at that um, because there are others who will aspire to matching us or overtaking us they won't be able to do that for a long time and that includes China but they do want to get get there back from the future to 2019 and I will ask you the last question before I will go back to Gadi. Uh, he said that the fact that uh, America haven't reacted to the Iranian gradual aggression, the empty tankers, the loaded tankers, the UAV, the Global Hawk, and then the attack on Saudi is encouraging the Saudis. What would you recommend if uh, the, the Iranians, uh, what would you recommend if you were the Secretary of Defense these days to the President of the United States to do? In, 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 as a general matter, um, uh, what I would recommend, and I don't want to second guess my successors, um, uh, but in general, uh, I am of the belief that it is better to push back early in a escalatory cycle than late. You know where the Iranians are going. They've said where they're going. They've said they're going to keep poking and keep poking and keep poking until they get the reaction they want, which is the conclusion by those of us on the other side that we have to return to the negotiating table with them and negotiate over maximum pressure. That's what they want. And they said they're going to they're going to push, push, push until they get that. Uh, and so you know that they will continue to escalate. And my concern about that is that inevitably, therefore, they will cross a line where we cannot tolerate it. And it's much better if you begin to push back well below that point. So I believe that I, I believe that everywhere in the world, I would say that same thing with respect to Russia, in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and so forth. I'd say the same thing with respect to China in the South China Sea. These are things that it's better to get started with early. So in, that's my general philosophy there, and therefore I think Israel and the United States are going to find themselves sometime down the road being faced with a provocation that we cannot um, ignore. Back to Gadi. Uh, <laughs> please put your, the translation on. Gadi, Atagam, Kmo Just as recommended Carter, by the Secretary uh, Carter, you also identified that we have to stop the Iranians early, if possible. And you conducted in the two years, or maybe four years, but especially in the last two years, a real battle that we in Israel call, uh, it's the campaign between the wars. <laughs> and the idea was to stop the Iranians without uh, deteriorating into a real war. And I think that the mark uh, that this uh, campaign deserves is very high, because the Iranians, and you'll explain whether they were stopped or not, but the estimate is that they were stopped, and we did not deteriorate to a war. However, I met uh, six months ago with the Prime Minister and I gave him a compliment for his uh, political leadership of this campaign, but I cautioned him and I said that it's like the playoff of the NBA, the first game, and there are more games to come. And this was also a home game in a certain way because the intelligence edge of Israel, the intelligence supremacy and the capability to operate the Air Force uh, without crossing the border, we had an advantage in this ball court. And we see that the Iranians, that we all know, they know how to investigate and they're very sophisticated. Actually, they realized that in Syria they have a problem and they moved into the two other countries, Lebanon and Iraq. So what I want to ask you is, 
whether this uh, doctrine of the uh, campaign between the wars did it succeed? Can it be implemented also in Iraq and Lebanon, at least in Lebanon, without uh, getting accelerated? We always quote uh, Clausewitz and to say that the army is one in one of two situations. Either it prepares for war or war. And the reality that we have in the last two decades, there's a third situation, that countries like Israel has a great uh, benefit to develop the concept of a campaign between the wars understanding that at the end of it, there might be a war. And so the basic condition is to always be very prepared to war, understanding that this uh, pattern should, can eventually get into war. But of course, there are all sorts of international uh, politics and economics, and, and there's an impact of all these on it. But we came to it in Syria because of lack of choice. The uh, picture we saw at the end of 2016 that the Iranians understand, first of all, that uh, victory over the Islamic State is just around the corner. They said there's a strong coalition of the United States and there's the Russian axis with Iranian, uh, uh, Syrians and Hezbollah. The victory is about to come. They didn't know when. So the Iranians made the decision to start taking steps that will enable them to obtain an Iranian hegemony in Syria the day after. And so we realized that they want to get to some 100,000 combatants from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq. They indoctrinate them for two, three weeks, and then they get ready, and they prepare um, uh, all the bases in the Air Force in Syria. They build intelligence bases in the Golan Heights. Therefore, the IDF recommendation to the government three years ago came because of lack of choice and understanding that not taking steps, not doing the right thing is going to create a very severe situation within three years, namely today. And therefore, we recommended to the government in Israel to take this as number one priority and to refer a lot of power in a very smart way and it happened, and it brought about uh, very good results. We didn't speak about it too much. Some of it came out uh, recently, the public got to know, and uh, IDF, I think, brought about a great benefit. And the phenomenon that happened is that uh, weight was shifted from Syria to the Western Iraq and to Iraq and created a different kind of a problem. And I think that for us, it was the right thing to do. It also brought about uh, regional collaborations. The reality is very complex. There are all sorts of Russian forces with the uh, air umbrella and uh, radar. And this reality is very complicated and complex. I think the decision of the Israeli government and the pattern of activity brought about a big strategic benefit to the state of Israel. But still, the Iranians are very determined, they're still there, but they're very far from their vision, the vision they presented in 2016 regarding Syria. Let's go from Syria to Lebanon. Both of us uh, were members of the headquarters in 2006. There was a lot of criticism on the war, and there were many things that actually we could have done better. But today we realized that the war in 2006 did uh, obtain a period of lull, of quiet, the longest in Israel in all its history. And there is deterrence against the Hezbollah. Nevertheless, it's mutual. Israel is also very cautious in not to act in Lebanon, as opposed to what it did in Syria. How do you see today Hezbollah? What is his uh, strategic uh, plan? When will he maybe become less deterrent? And uh, anything that you can update us in the five years that you were the commander of the Nor Northern Command, you were the general. The criticism that uh, was against us before and after the war was right, was correct. We told ourselves that we expected from ourselves to have 
greater achievements in the way we defend the country and the way we uh, do our uh, missions and attacks. But together with that, 13 years since the Second Lebanon War, there's a quiet on the Lebanese border, there's blossoming in the north, and since then, Lebanon and Hezbollah are in a very high priority. The Israeli public experienced uh, physically uh, more than 4,000 rockets launched into the state of Israel. That was a very harsh experience. The Israeli public did not understand in real time the strength of the damage that was made to Hezbollah. They were very surprised by our actions, both inside the Beirut in the Dachya area, but also against the Hezbollah centers in the villages in the south. They paid a very high price. And I think that this created the reality that for 13 years, there's a quiet in the Lebanese front, but this quiet is uh, an illusion of sorts because uh, very close to the end of the war, the organization made a decision to hold a project that seemed grandiose, the pattern of thought of the Iranian Al-Quds uh, power and Hezbollah is to create a, a pattern which is based on uh, great achievements from the past, but in a smaller scale, to have a small Yom Kippur war and to build uh, attack capability against Israel uh, in the tunnel, with the tunnels, and to surprise Israel in such a way that the Israeli public will experience something it never experienced in the past, an attack of thousands of Hezbollah combatants inside Israel. The second thing was the wish to have accurate weaponry, because they understand that Israel is, uh, has a supremacy in intelligence and air force and in attacks, and the Hezbollah wanted to bridge the gap by accurate capability to uh, hit uh, medium and long range uh, targets in the state of Israel. No question, we are in a completely different reality, both in our defense capability, three layers, and also our attack capability in Lebanon. Hezbollah knows this very well, but together with that, they have a capability of more than 130,000 rockets, short range, long range, which will cause uh, real damage to the Israeli home front. Altogether, the modus operandi of uh, this organization, it's not like the IDF. They want to act against the Israeli population, deep in the heart of Israel. And so there's a great deterrence of ours towards them, together with the understanding that a war in the north, uh, we're going to pay very high prices as well. But I have no doubt that if uh, there will be a third Lebanon war, the IDF capability, both the offense and defense, has uh, improved dramatically, but still we have to make a great effort in order to deter them from a war to continue the quiet and make them weak and uh, dismantle the Hezbollah and the major pressure on Iran actually serves this mission, the capability of Qasem al Sulaimani to transfer billion dollars uh, to Hezbollah has become very problematic in the last two years, and it has a great impact on the organization. What we've seen in the last few months in Lebanon is the effect of this reality, where masses are taking to the street and uh, struggling against Hezbollah, and I think this is an opportunity for the Western countries to help the Lebanese people to bring back Lebanon to the Lebanese and to take them from this strangling organization called Hezbollah. There's a new reality which wasn't there in the last few years. And so things that both Israel will do in order to improve reality with economic agreements for the benefit of the people in Lebanon, like gas, agreements and other things that we can promote, I think there's an opportunity today we didn't have in the past. The next question I'm going to ask both of you. There's some kind of feeling, or perhaps uh, understanding, that the state, that United States is disconnecting 
from the Middle East, that it is, has become less important to it. In the past, the issue of energy was critical. Now the United States is actually generating more than even Saudi Arabia. United States is no longer dependent on that from the Middle East. It is, yes, it is protecting the whole channels and um, of, of actual fuel that is coming in, but they're usually on their way to China and other places. They are changing their emphasis. They are now more interested in the Pacific, the Asia-Pacific area, rather than the Middle East. And after two wars, it is bipartisan nearly in the States that they really feel that they have to end these endless wars. How do both of you see this kind of disconnection and what does this mean for Israel? Of course, I think that the Israeli interest and the regional one and the global one, in fact, is to see the United States as a superpower, strong, dominant, impacting and influential in the Middle East. I think that is an Israeli significant interest and of course for the more moderate Sunni countries in the region and a global interest because the strengthening of other evil powers is always a bad harbinger to the world. I think that the achievement, the most impressive achievement of the United States that it led in its achievement um, for this reigning in and the finishing off of ISIS was a regional um, achievement, but it should have brought about perhaps this kind of American and Russian collaboration. But after this impressive uh, military achievement against ISIS, there should have been an additional stage that would have translated that achievement into a regional achievement. But uh, it's very difficult to actually see it happening. And I can understand all the sensitivities, but it won't happen without this coordination between the Americans and the Russians. So I think we still do need to strengthen the moderate Sunni countries. It's a really, it's something that should be very a strong desire and need here. For I think we need the American hand in that for the stability of the region, uh, but of the world as well. Okay, let's go back to the moderate Sunni countries in a moment. But. Uh, not able to speak for my government, but I, 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 I would say the, the following. Yes, we are paying a new attention, which I personally think is overdue to China, Russia, and so forth. Uh, but to me, that does, is, does not mean that we forget where, what our interests are in the Middle East. Um, now, I, not everybody else's problems in the Middle East are our interests. And so when we go into the Middle East, we're very clear-eyed about what are our American interests. American interests and Israeli interests do not coincide, but they overlap very substantially. And that is the basis for our friendship and our cooperation here. Um, but we have other interests as well, which either don't concern uh, um, uh, uh, Israel, uh, I, uh, we, we had, in my judgment, no choice um, but to destroy ISIS. Uh, they were trying to kill my people. And I am the, if I'm Secretary of Defense, my first job is to protect American people. And they were trying to kill our people either by directly or by inspiring some loser somewhere in the United States to get in his car and declare fealty to ISIS. And I can't have that. I can't have my people getting killed by, by this. So I had, we had to do that, in my judgment. It, it, we did it very successfully. I want to associate myself with both of you. I always, always said that I was confident of victory and that the hard part was the military and economic aftermath. 
And to those who in the United States or anywhere else are tired of endless wars, my advice is don't unwin the wars you've just won. And And I could, I could say the same thing for other places uh, as well. So we haven't forgotten about the, 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 the Middle East. Um, again, we, we pursue our own interests. And people used to ask me when I was Secretary of Defense, are, are you going to fix the Middle East? And I said, no. Uh, that, that's not, fixing the Middle East uh, is a wonderful aspiration, and I hope God has it. But I'm the Secretary of the Defense of the United States, and Beyond my, aspiration, his capabilities as well. my, my aspirations are only to defend uh, American interests. But I hasten to say, since I'm here in Israel with my friends, that our interests, we follow our interests, you follow our, your interests. It's not sentiment, but it's the observation that those interests are not identical, but s coincide substantially, which is the basis for our friendship. Um, with respect to so many things around the world. And it gets back to values. And if you get to Russia and China and you say, what do we have in common uh, with respect to Russia and China? I, you have your own interests with respect to those countries. We have our own interests with respect to those countries. But we share one thing that isn't very important to me. I, I think we do share values about uh, how society should conduct themselves and the responsibilities that people owe, uh, Western values, and I think they're the right ones, and I wouldn't trade them for Russia's, and I wouldn't trade them for, for China's, and I'm glad to have in the same foxhole with me in, on this earth partners like you and our European allies and some of our Asian allies, and that's the reason why allies and partners are good things too. Observation from Israel about uh, the American willingness to use military power. Uh, the, the two uh, very disturbing, long, uh, very, very uh, expensive in uh, blood and treasure wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, it seems like the Americans lost appetite or maybe lost the, the capability to have something that is not deteriorating to a full-scale war. Uh, I remember being in the Pentagon, the two terms were slippery slope and unintended consequences. How you again find a surgical, limited, well-planned operation that not deteriorate or slip, uh, uh, slip to a full-scale war? Uh, is that something that the American uh, generals lost? Well, uh, look, the, the experience that I think your question uh, springs from is the aftermath of the invasion of Iraq in 2003, which was a controversial act, which in retrospect was a mistake. I say that as someone who did not oppose it. So I, my hands are not clean in that regard, but I think anybody looking back would say that was a mistake because three years after we won and beat three, sorry, three weeks after we beat Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi people concluded that we were not victors but occupiers and we had a terrible time getting that back under control. And that really was a full-scale conflict and much American life and limb was lost. Uh, Afghanistan it was necessary for very different reasons also to go through a phase of surge, and I lived that also. Um, and um, Stephanie and I would go to the hospital every weekend in those days, and I now have, and yet we succeeded there and in Iraq and in against ISIS in getting the situation to a point where I think we can um, keep radicalism suppressed, not perfectly, but to a level that is safe for our own people for a very minimal additional commitment to mostly local people who do the serious security and police work. The Afghan security forces in Afghanistan, 
the Iraqi security forces in Iraq, and yes, the forces that we fought with in northeastern Syria. That's as good as it gets. And that is a sustainable victory if you sustain it. Now, if people are say, but if people who say they're tired of war, in uh, I, I, I say to them, what exactly are you tired of? Are you tired of watching on television? Are you tired of paying for it in taxes? I know people who are really tired of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq because they're people who don't have any legs or whose son or daughter is gone. That I understand. Um, but if we have gotten ourselves to a situation, as I think we did in northeastern Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan, that with the, a proper level of attention and support for local friends and allies, um, could continue to keep a threat to my people suppressed, I think that's about as good as it gets. I don't call that an endless war. I, 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 I do call it endless protection. And I need to offer my people endless protection. And uh, we've had that on the Korean Peninsula for 70 years, and it's been successful. We had it in Europe during the Cold War for 50 years, and that, that wasn't a waste. We successfully avoided what would have been a horrible, horrible war there and on the Korean Peninsula. And so endless protection is not endless war, and, I, and I'm for endless protection. Before I uh, move to the audience, let me ask if each of you uh, a personal question. Gadi, three of your The microphone. The three predecessors of yours uh, went to politics. What is your plans? <laughs> I've got to wake everyone up, he says. It doesn't actually arouse or whet my appetite to join it. With all my deep appreciation of all those three, and they have been friends for many years, but you know and I know that it came from the fact that they want to impact this country and turn it into a stronger country, a more just one. That's what it emanated from with all my three predecessors, perhaps something more equal, with a more egalitarian. And the military service awards people who serve it in so many years. It is the understanding that you are serving this country and you're carrying out campaigns and doing something that is bigger than you, greater than you. And therefore, I'm observing them from the side and I... I appreciate the fact that they want to turn Israel into a better country. Okay. I sat beside Amos for five years in the general staff and beside the generals, the chief of the general staff, and I know how to formulate what I want to say well. <laughs> Secretary Carter, some people who are... Uh, uh, finishing, uh, terminating the uh, formal position, uh, become addicted to the secret intelligence reports and the DIA briefing and uh, all the intercept uh, of uh, very good SIGINT. How you cope with, uh, with uh, the fact that you don't have the confidential information and in the same time people are waiting to see your analysis and your policy recommendation without the confidential? It's a, it's a good question. I mean, first of all, when I need to learn something, I can, I'm able to learn it. I am, I, that courtesy continues. And kept your... So, your so I don't, yeah, I don't have any problem when I need to, to, to know something. You would be surprised how, I, and I was always, and I used to say this to people all the, all the time, I have, had a top secret sensitive compartmented information clearance since 1980. 
and during all those years and all those phases, I've, I cannot think of a major policy circumstance that turned upon a nugget of <coughs> intelligence. Um, uh, occasionally we keep some weapons that we have secret, uh, very secret, I, and they'll play an important part but not a decisive part in, 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 in wars. Um, and so I would take your question. I'm asked it a lot by people in term for themselves, and they say, how can I, a citizen, know enough to make judgments about my own foreign policy? And I tell people that they see right in front of them 99% of the relevant material, and they should be confident that there isn't behind some door a set of facts that is widely at variance with what they are able to understand. Um, and, uh, I, you know, so that is a fact. Now, if you get down to a particular raid or a particular threat, a particular time when you're doing a particular operation, yeah, that'll turn on. And, and if, I were con if I were conducting those operations now, I would need to know that kind of information. Uh, but that's a kind of tactical use of 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 uh, that sort of information. But I think the best way to answer your question is to say to the citizen that in almost all cases you have everything you need to know in order to encourage and support your government uh, to do the right thing. And you ought to have confidence that there isn't another layer to things that you don't see you know, you know, you know, that that's not true. There's detail, but there's not a whole other layer to these issues. I fully agree. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Uh, please say who you are. Question is a short sentence with a question mark at the end. <laughs> Microphone, please. Could you please ask them to speak into a microphone? No, you can ask in Hebrew, but please ask in a microphone. Okay. Okay, the question is about uh, a defense uh, a fact of Israel and, uh, the, Amer and the U.S. Uh, PAC. 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 Treaty. Defense treaty. Uh, my English is from the kibbutz, so. Uh, and the question is, uh, is that uh, going uh, according to the Israeli a defense doctrine, and what's the limitation or the advantages and disadvantages of a defense treaty, uh, which was discussed before the last election. Uh, the President of the United States was very cautious to postpone it after the election, but since we have another election, it's coming again. <laughs> so, uh, uh, shall I answer that? Yes. Uh, for you, you, you may have more current information about whether any discussions are going on. Um, I don't think we, I think the United States and Israel both can have a very clear picture of their own interests and that that picture will show both of them that, as I said before, their interests are not identical but overlap substantially. That's the be that's better than any kind of treaty you could have. That, that understanding that we need each other, that we benefit from one another, and that we share a lot when it comes to both threats and opportunities in the world. And I wouldn't tell you that I was a friend of Israel if I didn't think that being friend of Israel was compatible with being a friend of America. I'm American. 
Um, but I don't have any problem telling you that. And, I, and most Americans are like that. Most Americans have a view of Israel that it's not that your problems are our problems. It's that our problems and your problems overlap very substantially. So I, I don't see that we need or get anywhere by trying to write that down, I think we're in a pretty good spot. We work together very well, very effectively. Uh, we understand one another. Uh, and believe me, when we need to work together, we know how to work together very effectively. Uh, and any common enemy ought to watch out uh, uh, for us. So I, I think we're doing pretty well and don't need any more written down. That's my personal view. If someone else wants to raise that possibility, they can. I don't object to it, but I don't think we need it. Brita Agana, Alta Miss of Shnota Hamishim, Kemachshava. As a thought from the end of the 50s in the Israeli leadership, through an understanding that Israel has a security challenge, Israel is surrounded by enemies. So what they believed over the years was that Israel is defending itself with its own power, with its own forces. Israel nowadays is an unbeatable country in our history and our enemies have not succeeded in having a decisive victory over us. We haven't got that sort of decisive iron wall around us. But Israel has become, slowly over the years, a very strong country. And the state of Israel, and in the foreseeable future, can defend itself with its own forces. I don't think it's necessary. During the time that Israel is at its its zenith of its, its powers, um, is it has a strategic supremacy as opposed to our enemies and over them. I think that that is something should not be promoted at the moment, but we should promote, promote and foster the very special ties between Israel and America that are based on shared values and shared interests. Israel, over the years, has brought a very high capability that um, really is necessary. And Amos Yadlin was involved, for example, in the attack of the, of the attack, the reactor, and it would be very difficult to, to imagine what the Middle East would have looked like had that not happened. If those programs had, if the nuclear programs had actually reached their capabilities. So therefore, in this, at this time and in the foreseeable future, Israel is a very strong country with its security and our enemies know it and we know how to provide response to any threats that I could possibly foresee and if a very grave or severe reality develops and a nuclear capability is added then I do see an existential threat, then we could talk about various pacts like that. But at the moment, I think there is no point actually promoting such a pact. And I, similar to those that the states have with other countries. I'm terribly sorry, but I can't hear it. Please ask Mr. Yadlin to repeat it. Israel. We said a short sentence with a question mark at the end. Should 
Should I? Two questions. One, uh, Gadi have said that Israel was never defeated, and uh, Professor Zaki Shalom asking whether what happening with Gaza is not an Israeli victory. And second, how we prepare the, uh, the public to uh, the fact that Hamas and Hezbollah for sure can paralyze the country uh, by their uh, missiles and rockets. I think from a factual point of view, you're right. Yes, it is a small organization, relatively weak, and its, its modus operandi is enabling it to barrage Israel with missiles and to paralyze. I'm not sure if it's a true paralysis, but definitely um, partially paralyze uh, civilian areas. And it's something dissimilar to anything that's happened in the past. So, yes, we needed a better security response, uh, and uh, as we do now, and they should live in a state of lull and peace, as they do in the center of the country. But the reality is really harsh. I'm talking about the years 20,000 and 2004. People were committing suicide, suicide bombers on buses. There were 200 that were killed, and there were one... 16,000 we're talking about were wounded and we defeated terror but we carried on and so therefore I believe it's incumbent upon us and we will find a solution to what's happening in the Gaza Strip and not enable this reality to continue but there's no kind of th thing a panacea in one fell swoop Israel has gone out to through three campaigns in the Gaza Strip 2008 2014 and from in 2008, in order to solve the problem that was created there, we actually activated a whole division. And uh, then in 2014, we attacked it with five divisions. And yes, the peace lasted for three and a half years. The lull lasted for that. But the Hezbollah decided to initiate that modus operandi of the marchers and those detonators. And they actually built a force that has been in existence for many years, and they can continue using it. But during this period, on one hand, you feel, wow, yes, they're managing to really bother our home front. But on the other hand, their actual, the balance of their losses is immense. I think that how we found a solution to the terror bombers and the terror of the suicide bombers, we will find a solution. It's more complex because you can see that there are thousands of Palestinians with a leadership that wants to negate the actual existence of the state of Israel and want to actually continue barraging us. But from the very first date of a day of our inception, we are fighting against enemies, and the IDF was built against worse enemies than the Hezbollah and Hamas. And so therefore, the proof will be in the pudding. If anyone thinks that you can just shake, the, shake things up and they will disappear, no, that's not true. When I was the chief of general staff, I said that we have to find a solution full stop. Now I say it's much more complex. There are security and military issues, social issues, economic um, aspects to it, and even state issues. And there are Palestinians who are building up their capabilities, and it's part of an ongoing struggle that has lasted for over a hundred years and there won't be a panacea swift one overnight so we have to have a very impressive force that was uh, that we have to really meet and yes on the other hand there is a very complex solution and we have to find one that won't happen overnight he's saying I wonder how we they translated what I said was the panacea overnight. Believe me, we are uh, recently hearing that uh, Iran is exceeding the limitations of uh, JCPOA gradually, so uh, gradually violating. How probable uh, would you as assess that the U.S. and Israel uh, will attack Iran if it advances towards a weapon, uh, nuclear weapon?
Uh, well, first of all, your premise is right. They, the um, Iranians are progressing, beginning to take steps that they had not taken under the JICPOA. Um, and I, I, again, can't speak for my current government, let alone the Israeli government, but the American government, governments, I have observed, and including the ones I've served, I'm pretty confident we're not going to allow Iran to get a bomb. I, 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 I know that for a fact, for the ones I served, we certainly had the capability to see that they didn't. And that capability, we didn't change after the JICPOA. Um, remember, that agreement placed no limits on us. And so we continued to have <coughs> the so-called military option, which I think we showed e enough of to our Israeli military colleagues that they were satisfied that it was would truly be do what it said it was going to do. <coughs> and I think Israel has worked on that problem uh, itself. So that evidence, without being able to speak for my government at the moment, that accumulated evidence suggests that both, that both of our countries have recognized Iran getting the bomb as a matter that, the, that we, we certainly made preparations to take care of militarily. Now, I have to say at the same time <coughs> that uh, the alternative to that is to try to get Iran back in some place where a bomb is not imminent. I don't know whether that's possible or not, but I think that needs to be also a strand of effort. Um, we've ab abandoned the JICPOA. <coughs> I understand that I, well, I would not have recommended that course myself, but it is what it is. And we find ourselves in a different place now, and we need to go on from where we are now. Um, I think we should go on together. Um, uh, and, and with our partners in Europe, at least, who see things more or less the same way we do, and try to put together a diplomatic package that accompanies the military package. I talked earlier about um, I believe we need to push back against some of these actions against Iran before they get out of hand, which is different from their, mili their, their nuclear actions. But the reason to push back is so that it doesn't lead to something much bigger by them continuing to escalate until we have no choice but to do something militarily. That's the foolishness of allowing things to escalate. And so that you have to accompany that pushback by offering them some alternative and I, I do think we need to create that alternative at the same way we, time we create protection uh, for ourselves. And that, too, should be a joint project. It's not going to be the JICPOA, because the JICPOA has been rejected by your government and by my government. But it, we should try something else. At the same time, we're renewing our commitment militarily to push back against Iran in the nuclear area and in all the other malign activities that it uh, uh, carries out in the Middle East, which are not only on the nuclear front, as we all know. Last question. Young man. Thank you. My question is about another regional power which was not mentioned. I'm talking about Turkey. Uh, Turkey is being really aggressive towards a few of its neighbors, including Greece, Cyprus, Egypt. In a few days ago, they signed this treaty claiming large swaps of the Mediterranean Sea. What can, <clears throat> what can the Americans do about a NATO ally that acts this way? And how do they see Turkey and the role that it plays? Thank you. Well, I mean, it's, look, uh, I'm not, no point in glossing over it. It's really tough with Erdogan and Turkey. Um, I uh, disagree with him 
uh, about where Turkey's long-term destiny lies. I think it lies in alignment with the West. Um, I think his confidence in that was shook not by NATO, but by the EU. And uh, he then began to cast about looking for alternatives. Um, that is psychologically understandable, um, but he doesn't have a real alternatives. He, he really doesn't. Um, uh, and so uh, Turkey's future does lie with, with, with NATO. And at the same time, I don't want NATO to lose Turkey either. So we're going to have to work on this. And we're going to have to deal with Mr. Erdogan as Mr. Erdogan is. Uh, and I tried to do that uh, during my time in, in office. And I would tell him that um, uh, <clears throat> I thought that his, his interests would ultimately align him with NATO and the West. I didn't want NATO to close the door in the way that the EU closed the door. Um, Turkey will be here for a long time. It'll, beyond all of us, beyond Mr. Erdogan, if I may say so, and any one leader, and we need to play the long game uh, here. And uh, So there may be a period of time when we don't see eye to eye on that issue, but that's okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure my eye is right. Let me say just a few words about it, because to think that the strategic vision of the Prime Minister was initially to create a strategic pact between Israel, Turkey and Iran, these two non-Arab countries, and that teaches us about the changes and the turnarounds and the need to base uh, the Israeli security with long, wide uh, friendship to uh, give a solution to all the developments and changes. The most important thing is the awareness and the flexibility, and therefore that uh, doctrine which uh, has to be updated and make different answers and a very sophisticated army, but uh, very strong as well. Our time is up. Time is up. Time is up. We could spend the whole evening until midnight uh, discussing uh, a very important issues and very interesting issue. I want to thank, first of all, to the two students, because we have done this event uh, based on the Kennedy School Forum, which uh, bring uh, students to hear uh, dignitaries and people with uh, experience. I want to thank the rest of the audience that came. Uh, I found in the U.S. that they are thanking every general for the service to his country. So I want to thank uh, Gadi for many, many. How many? 41. 41. Okay. 41 years of very dedicated service and uh, uh, really, uh, I think, one of the best chief of staff that we had, and history will be even better for him. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Secretary Carter for serving so many years and combining the academic knowledge with being a practitioner. And thank you for being a friend of Israel and American patriot. Thank you.